Welcome to London Futurists. My name is David Wood and it's my pleasure and privilege to chair this meeting. Today's format is Towards an Artificial Consciousness. In London Futurists, we've discussed artificial intelligence many times over the years, possibly in over 100 meetups. But when that discussion has tended to move towards artificial consciousness, we've often tried to steer conversation away from it because it often hasn't seemed particularly productive. But not today. Today's speaker, Professor Mark Solms, has given a great deal of thought and has got some extremely interesting things to say on that topic, in my view. Professor Solms is Director of Neuropsychology in the Neuroscience Institute of the University of Cape Town, uh, near where he's uh, connecting from today. He's also a lecturer in neurosurgery at the Royal London Hospital School of Medicine and a fellow of the American College of Psychiatrists. As I said, he's spent his entire career in various ways investigating the mysteries of consciousness. And inside his own profession, he achieved renown for identifying the brain mechanisms of dreaming, and for bringing psychoanalytic insights into modern neuroscience. And now his book, The Hidden Spring, is bringing him renown far beyond his profession, rightly so. Professor Solms, uh, over to you. Thank you, David. I'm glad that uh, David introduced me as a neuroscientist. Uh, my um, foray into artificial intelligence and artificial consciousness in particular um, has been almost accidental. Uh, I have I found myself compelled uh, to uh, confront the possibility of an artificial consciousness only very recently in my work, and uh, I'll explain uh, how and why uh, in in a few minutes. I I'm going to spend a few minutes just summarizing what seem to me to be the main issues, um, which which lead us uh, to that pass. And uh, I intend to speak for less than half an hour uh, to give us an hour of, of discussion time. I'm going to now share my screen. So there's my topic, of course. Here goes, really a, a headlines only whiz through the issues. Um, here's a physicist, Paul Davies, uh, saying, as many scientists do, that consciousness uh, is the number one problem of science today. Um, this uh, is mainly due to the prominence that David Chalmers brought to the problem uh, when he famously, in 1995, formulated what he called the hard problem of consciousness. Um, his um, statement of the problem is on the screen, but I've highlighted this phrase, um, which is uh, the question as to why should this um, information processing that goes on in, in our brains uh, why should it feel like something? Uh, this, this how and why does it happen that consciousness, uh, that there's something it is like to be conscious, to perform these functions uh, that we call consciousness? Uh, and uh, Chalmers' um, statement of the problem derives from Tom Nagel's earlier uh, uh, famous paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat?, where he said, an organism has conscious mental states if and only if there is something that it is like to be that organism, something it's like for the organism. And he went on to say that if we acknowledge that a physical theory of mind must account for the subjective character of experience, we must admit that no presently available conception gives us a clue about how this could be done. So here's the problem summarized so that we're clear about what we are addressing here. Why and how is there something it is like to be an organism? something it is like for the organism. I want to start, I'm going to give you a, a six uh, case um, vignettes, very, very brief ones. Uh, and this is the case that started my interest in the problem. Uh, it is actually the case of my older brother. This is me, uh, and uh, he's two years older than me. And when I was four years old and he six, he fell uh, three stories uh, from a building uh, the roof of a building onto his head, fractured his skull, and sustained an intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, which changed him dramatically as a person. So I was confronted very early on in life uh, with the uh, sort of disturbing fact that somehow we are uh, 
this organ in our brains. My brother, although he looked the same, was no longer the same person. And uh, although I didn't there and then set out uh, to study uh, this problem, I'm sure it must be why I later uh, decided to study neuroscience. Um, and uh, when I did so, uh, we learned all about the mental functions of the cortex, but they were just functions. Uh, here's an example, um, the famous diagram of Fellerman and Van Essen, um, of how visual information is processed in the cortex. Um, and when you study uh, the mind in this way, if what motivated you was you wanted to understand things like how come your brother uh, came back as a different person, um, and uh, if that happened to him, is it not also applicable to me that I, my very sentient being, is somehow bound up with uh, this, uh, this organ? Uh, learning about these functions um, and these functional um, information processing diagrams for vision and language and uh, executive control and memory and so on. It didn't quite satisfy uh, the thing that had driven me uh, into this field in the first place. Um, I, at that time, which was the mid-1980s when I uh, graduated, um, at that time this uh, book of Oliver Sacks came out uh, in which he made this wonderful statement uh, which spoke exactly to the frustration that I uh, was experiencing. He said that neuropsychology, like classical neurology, aims to be entirely objective, and its great power and its advances come from just this. But a living creature, and especially a human being, is first and last active, a subject, not an object. It's precisely the subject, the living eye, which is being excluded. Here was the sentence that grabbed me. Neuropsychology is admirable, but it excludes the psyche. It excludes the experiencing active living eye. That was the thing that I uh, thought I was going to learn about um, by training in this field. And it was precisely that that was missing. So uh, when Chalmers published this paper uh, in uh, 1995, it spoke to exactly the thing that was disturbing me about my field. He said that the easy problems are problems about functions, you know, like that diagram you just saw. It explains the functional mechanisms of visual information processing, but it says nothing about what it is like to see. Uh, I'm not going to read this long uh, 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 passage from Chalmers. I'm just, you can see, I'm emphasizing this word. It's all about functions and mechanisms, and he's saying those are the easy problems. He says that the hard problem is the question, why doesn't all this information processing go on in the dark, free of any inner feel? His main point was cognitive neuroscience uh, describes or, or, or discerns the functions underlying uh, mental processing uh, in information processing mechanistic terms, but that, that knowledge uh, of, the, of the functional mechanisms um, of, of the mind do not begin to explain why there's something it is like uh, to perform those functions. And um, it's, uh, uh, this, this, this problem is captured in Frank Jackson's knowledge argument, which Chalmers references. Uh, that argument goes something like this, I'm simplifying, that imagine um, a, a visual neuroscientist named Mary, who's blind, congenitally blind. She's never experienced sight but she knows everything there is to know about the functions of vision. She knows exactly what happens you know, to, to um, uh, light uh, hitting the rods and cones in the retina, how it gets transduced into nerve impulses propagated by the lateral geniculate to the visual cortex, and how it then gets processed uh, in the way that that uh, Fellerman and Van Essen diagram shows in all these multiple uh, modularized processing streams. She knows all of that but she has never experienced vision. Uh, and Jackson's argument is if one day the gift of sight is suddenly bestowed upon her, she will learn something utterly new about vision, something that was not predicted, uh, still less explained, uh, by all of her knowledge about the functional mechanisms of vision. So th this is Chalmers's point, that explaining the functional mechanisms uh, of consciousness and all these other uh, mental processes does not explain why there is something it is like 
to, to, to have those functions. Um, which leads us to the disturbing conclusion that perhaps the experience um, of the qualia of consciousness exists in some parallel universe, something outside of physics, some, something outside of the a, a natural lawful universe. A very disturbing and, and you know, frankly, uh, 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 unacceptable uh, conclusion. So let me state it again in this form. Here is the hard problem of consciousness. Why is the performance of these functions accompanied by experience? Why doesn't all this information processing go on in the dark, free of any inner feel? Well, one reason why that problem arises is because as we learned in the 1980s and 90s, uh, cortical information processing is not intrinsically conscious. Um, as the title of this famous review paper of uh, John Kilstrom um, uh, states, uh, it's perfectly possible to perceive without awareness of what one is perceiving and likewise to learn in the process without awareness of what one has learned. Uh, uh, it's important to know that what this refers to is not just that some um, subcortical processes uh, go on unconsciously. This applies to cortical processes. And this applies to uniquely human cortical processes, such as, for example, reading with comprehension. One can read with comprehension without any awareness of what one has read. So the question arises uh, for Chalmers and, and his uh, like, uh, if that's possible, then what does the consciousness add? I think that's a legitimate question when it comes to cortical processes, precisely because cortical processes do not need to be conscious. They can do exactly the same job without consciousness. So it's no surprise that since we have been focusing on visual information processing as our model example of how to tackle the problem of consciousness, that we've been looking uh, to the wrong place. We've been looking to cortical visual functions which are not intrinsically conscious. And so it's no surprise that we have uh, been stumped in the process. Let me uh, now go to two further cases, um, which uh, illustrate, in fact, three further cases, which illustrate the depth uh, of the problem I've just mentioned. Um, cortical uh, theorists of consciousness uh, point to particular parts of cortical processing, which are supposed to be where it all comes together, where this sentient being, the subject of the mind, receiving all this information, uh, actually experiences it. And one of those is the global workspace theory, which claims that the prefrontal cortex uh, looks back, as it were, on all this information processing going on in the posterior cortices, and, and there um, uh, it, 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 is, it, is, it becomes globally available to sentient being. Uh, I'm going to give you a case of my own, uh, who has absolutely no prefrontal cortex to show you that this is not where the experiencing subject resides. I asked him, are you consciously aware of your thoughts? And he said, yes, of course I am. And then I said, I'm going to ask you to solve a problem that will require you to consciously picture a situation in your mind, which he agreed to do. I said, imagine that you have two dogs and one chicken. He says, okay. Then I say, do you see them in your mind's eye? And he says, yes. So I say, now tell me how many legs do you see in total? You can see how this requires him to reflect upon his own information processing, to actually experience it in his mind's eye. And he counts up the legs, and to my great disappointment, he said, eight. I said, eight? And he said, yes, the dogs ate the chicken. I think you'll agree with me that that's evidence enough to show that there's somebody at home, despite the absolute absence of prefrontal cortex. Uh, the other um, uh, cortical region uh, that is supposed to be the, um, the physical basis of the sentient self is the insula, the anterior insula in particular. And this is associated with the work of Bud Craig. Uh, my colleague Antonio Damasio had a patient with absolutely no insula, destroyed by herpes simplex encephalitis. And uh, he did an interview with the patient, much like the one I did with my patient W. Uh, 
And here, I'll just get to the bottom line. Damasio says, are you aware that I'm aware? And the patient says, I am aware that you are aware that I'm aware. So anybody who can say things like that uh, clearly does not lack a self. Uh, is perfectly, uh, there's a sentient being present there. Uh, so neither prefrontal cortex nor um, insular cortex can reasonably be claimed to be the physical basis of the subject of the mind, the experiencing sentient I that Oliver Sacks referred to. But of course, these patients still have some intact cortex. Uh, so uh, that doesn't by itself demolish um, that those two bits of evidence, uh, the cortical theory of consciousness. This absolute assumption that consciousness is cortical, despite uh, the fact that we know that the cortex can function perfectly well unconsciously. So what happens if you have absolutely no cortex, uh, as these children do, children born with a condition known as hydranencephaly, where they have an intact brainstem, but absolutely no forebrain uh, with its cortex. Uh, these children, here she is, the child who scan you've just seen, she's conscious. She wakes up in the morning, goes to sleep at night, but much more tellingly, she reacts emotionally to stimuli like her baby brother being placed on her lap. She goes, ah, as he's put there. She likes it. So she's emotionally responsive. And I'm just showing you one example here. She's emotionally responsive across a, a variety of basic emotions like fright and anger uh, and, and, and uh, laughter, etc. cetera. Uh, always in a situationally appropriate way, she responds, as do most of these children. So how are we to make sense of the fact that children with absolutely no cortex uh, are conscious in the sense of being awake and emotionally responsive? In other words, there's actually a quality and a content to their sentience uh, entirely uh, uh, devoid uh, of cortical processing. This surely suggests that consciousness um, in its basic affective form is generated not uh, in the cortex, but rather in the brain stem. Oh, here's a summary of how these children behave. I'll just, I just highlighted all of the emotional responses showing uh, what I've just said to you. Now, uh, in stark contrast to the cortex, which when removed in its entirety, uh, leaves the patient conscious as you've just seen and emotionally responsive, uh, all you need is a tiny two cubic millimeter lesion in the brain stem in the parabrachial nucleus in particular, uh, in the reticular activating system to obliterate consciousness entirely. So we've known in fact, since the middle of the 20th century that cortical consciousness is contingent upon brainstem arousal. We used to think that that was just a quantitative power supply. So we, we spoke of it as a level of consciousness or wakefulness. And we thought that the qualia are all entirely uh, cortical. And what I've just showed you is that's not true. Unless you believe, and it's reasonable to suspect, that these children might look as if they're conscious, uh, but they're not actually conscious. How can we know? So we don't rely on only one method. Uh, that's the lesion method, damaging cortex, removing cortex in its entirety, as we do also in other animals. These are obviously accidents of nature, but we experimentally remove cortex in other mammals, and we, we see the same thing that they are conscious in the sense of being awake and emotionally reactive. So that suggests that this part of the brain uh, that we have long recognized is a prerequisite for cortical consciousness actually has a quality and a content of its own, namely affect, feeling. So here's some other kinds of evidence showing you the same thing. Here's a patient uh, who had a deep brain stimulator placed, placed in a part of her reticular activating system who fell into a suicidal depression. This patient has no psychiatric history, but the second, well, within five seconds of stimulating her reticular activating system, she was, she was thrown into this intense affective state, deep, deep depression, which receded as soon as the, stimula, the, stimula, the electrical stimulation was switched off. You could reliably reproduce this observation every time um, the, the reticulate nucleus in question was activated, she fell back into a depressive state. So that's another line of evidence showing that this patient 
uh, you can generate intense affective states by stimulating the brain stem. Here's another method, functional neuroimaging, showing that in intense emotional states like these four, in each of them, the arousal, the activation that generates the affect is not cortical, but rather subcortical, and in particular, in the brain stem. And the same applies to the drugs that psychiatrists give. They act on this nucleus for dopamine antipsychotics. They act on this nucleus for serotonin with antidepressants. They act on this nucleus for noradrenaline in the case of anti-anxiety drugs. So what these, what these chemicals sourced in reticulate brainstem nuclei are doing is not just switching on the lights uh, in some quantitative sense. They're actually generating the foundational form of consciousness, which is affect. So that uh, leads me to the conclusion uh, that we shouldn't be looking to a structure which is not intrinsically conscious, that does its job without consciousness, if we're wanting to, to crack the hard problem. We should be looking to these structures, which are the very font of consciousness and which generate not a cognitive consciousness, but rather an affective consciousness, raw feelings. Even the discoverer of the unconscious nature of cognition, uh, Sigmund Freud, uh, 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 conceded that when it comes to emotions or feelings or affects, we can't speak about them as being unconscious. The possibility of an unconscious feeling is an oxymoron. How can you have a feeling that you don't feel. Now, I know that these words are used in different senses by different scientists, so I want to make clear what I mean. I'm, that's why I'm, uh, I'm emphasizing the word feeling. I'm saying that no, you cannot have a feeling that you don't feel. If there are unconscious affective processes, that's all well and good, but that affective process that we call feeling is by its very nature felt, and it's that that these upper brainstem nuclei, the foundations of all consciousness generate, raw feelings. And so my argument is, and this is the essence of my argument, that if we want to understand uh, what consciousness is all about, we should be looking to this region of the brain and this form of consciousness, which is its elemental foundational form. Chalmers said that there's no cognitive function such that we can say in advance, that explanation of that function will automatically explain experience. There you have that knowledge argument thing again. But would he have said the same thing if he was talking not about cognitive functions, but rather affective functions? Could you say there is no affective function such that we can say in advance that explanation of that function will automatically explain experience? I'm saying, yes, there is one. Uh, you, you, the, the, the function of feeling, must explain why it feels like something because feeling is intrinsically felt. It's an intrinsically conscious state. So whatever function it performs, uh, that, that function must explain why it feels like something, unlike vision, which does not have to be conscious in order to do its functional job. The function of feeling is homeostasis. Now there's a great deal that could be said about this. I'm just whizzing over it. Homeostasis we have a settling point, a, a, a viable range in, in regard to various physiological parameters that we have to remain in, like, for example, core body temperature. You have to stay between 36 and 37 and a half degrees Celsius. Deviations from that are a demand upon the body to perform work. It has an algorithm in its homeostatic control center, which says, do the following, uh, execute the following reflex in order to get yourself back into your viable range. For example, uh, perspire and, and pant. Uh, this cools you down. Uh, what consciousness adds to this homeostatic function, in other words, consciousness in its basic form, which is feelings, is it enables the animal to know how it's doing in relation to its homeostatic needs. And what that adds is the possibility of choice. So if the animal finds itself in an unpredicted situation, one for which it has no pre-wired algorithm, uh, feeling enables the animal to make choices on the basis of what feels bad, which predicts its demise, uh, versus what feels good, which, uh, which shows things are going better for you. Um, and that is the function of feeling. Feeling enables voluntary action in unpredicted environments. It is an enormous adaptive advantage. It, it enables us not only to choose, 
uh, in situations in which we have no pre-configured predictions, uh, but it enables us also to learn from that experience um, and to make better choices in future. I think that addresses this question. Why and how is there something it is like to be an organism? Something it is like for the organism? Uh, well, when you look to feeling rather than vision, uh, I think that this question doesn't seem particularly perplexing. Now, uh, I work together with this colleague, uh, Carl Friston. Uh, I read a paper of his a few years ago in one of the journals of the Royal Society, in which he reduced the function of homeostasis uh, to um, a, a, a set of equations. And it's no surprise that it should be possible to do that. Homeostasis, as I've just explained to you, it's not exactly complicated. You have a control center, uh, which, uh, which is where the predictions uh, reside. Uh, you, have, you have a receptor and you have an effector. So the control center, based on information about its state, uh, executes actions which are, to, which are aimed at correcting its state to bring it back within its viable bounds. Uh, what's added is the capacity to register errors. This is how learning becomes possible. So the, the control center, the internal states of the system, um, generate on the basis of information about deviations from where it expects to be, it generates an action, uh, and it predicts that that action will, will bring it into the sensory state that it needs to be in. And if it does not, that's an error signal. And that error signal enables uh, the system to learn, to update its predictive model on the basis of errors uh, in the actions that it performs, uh, uh, leading to prediction errors. So this is the basic model that uh, Friston outlined in that paper that so impressed me, that this is the mechanism of homeostasis uh, reduced to an equation. And I thought to myself, those brainstem nuclei that perform homeostatic functions of the kind that Friston has uh, reduced to equations in this paper, the paper was entitled Life as We Know It, uh, that those very same nuclei are responsible for consciousness, for feeling this extended form of homeostasis. And that's why I um, uh, decided or, uh, to, to collaborate with him uh, in order to uh, work out what this extended form of homeostasis might consist in. And basically it boils down to what we call precision weighting, that is to say, to say statistical confidence uh, in the prediction. Uh, and this is a modulatory function uh, whereby the, 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 the confidence that the organism has in the error signals versus the predictions, and of course these are in direct proportion to each other, precision must always equal one. Uh, as error signals increase, um, they're increasingly precise. In other words, there's increasingly um, a, a narrow variance in an error signal, so one loses confidence in one's prediction, and vice versa, that as things turn out as expected, uh, so uncertainty is reduced. And this is the function of affect, as I showed you earlier, that if things are turning out as expected, that's pleasurable. If, things, if uncertainty prevails, that's unpleasurable. That's the basic extended function of homeostasis. It all has to do with precision weighting, which is exactly what the brainstem arousal structures do. Uh, physiologically, we call precision weighting postsynaptic gain. It's exactly what reticular activating arousal is all about. So it's a matter of palpating predictions uh, in relation to error signals and shifting the balance in the favor of the one or the other on the basis of how am I doing in terms of my basic value system uh, broadcast to me uh, as an organism in the form of feelings. I know I'm whizzing over things. I'm very sorry. I'm just trying to give you a basic sketch of the picture. I'll end with this case. This is a case of mine uh, who had a tumor, uh, an olfactory sheath meningioma over here. Uh, the removal of the tumor sadly resulted in damage to the basal forebrain, which is where another neuromodulator, acetylcholine, um, uh, is sourced. Acetylcholine has everything to do with the modulation of error signals. Uh, and so as a result of this lesion, uh, this, that modulatory function that I spoke of earlier was lost in this patient. He comes into my room, uh, which he's been in, this is my consulting room uh, at the Royal London, and he said to me, it's quite a nice little room. And I say, don't you remember, you've been here before. 
because the lesion that this patient had produced a confabulatory amnesic state. Uh, and he said, no, why, why would I have come here before? I said, you came here yesterday. Denise, his wife, brought you here to London. He was from Johannesburg, this patient. He was brought to London to, 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 to see me. Uh, and I said, you came here yesterday. Denise brought you here to London to consult me about your memory. You're having memory problems. That's why you don't remember being here yesterday. He said, did you say London? We are not in London. Of course, he doesn't remember the journey. So I say, yes, we are. Look out the window. It had been snowing and it never snows in Johannesburg. So he says, shocked, no. Looking out the window, seeing the snow, no. I know we're in Joburg. And I said, but look there. It's been snowing. It never snows in Johannesburg. And he says, yes, yes. Just because you're eating pizza, it doesn't mean you're in Italy. So you see there how the precision weighting, uh, the affective uh, panic uh, uh, in his case, upon realizing he doesn't understand how on earth he came to be here, uh, how, he, he, how he shifts the precision uh, in favor, the confidence that is, in favor of his prediction, notwithstanding the error signals. And this in a very simple way, and I'm sorry I have to whiz like that, uh, this brainstem function, uh, which should result in him uh, up-regulating the error signal, changing his predictive model. Uh, 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 you see how that doesn't work. In his case, he sticks with the prediction that is in Johannesburg, despite the evidence out the window that is in London, and how this is regulated by feeling. Um, I wish I had more time to go into that case. Uh, but I think that this, by shifting our focus to feeling and to the basic homeostatic functions of the brain stem, changes the game in terms of the hard problem of consciousness. And it answers questions like this. Why is the performance of these functions accompanied by experience? Why doesn't all this information processing go on in the dark, free of any inner feel? That function could not possibly go on in the dark without any inner feel, because its very function is to create inner feels. And I hope I've been able, even in this very abbreviated uh, presentation, to convey to you what the functional contribution of feeling is, how it makes a difference um, in ways that, uh, that, that, that visual and other perceptual and cognitive qualia do not do. I've only been able to give you a clue. Uh, all of this uh, is, is a tiny summary of what's ex explicated in a few hundred pages in this book. So I'm afraid you're going to have to read this book if you want to properly uh, uh, grasp uh, the, the argument I've tried to summarize in these few sentences. I'll conclude by saying, if it is possible to reduce the function of feeling, the elemental form of consciousness, to a set of equations, because they are, after all, nothing complicated. Uh, they are merely an extended form of homeostasis. If that is truly what causes consciousness, then uh, as much as it surprises me myself uh, to say this, uh, I would have to concede that then it should be possible to engineer it. If these truly are the mechanisms that generate feelings, then we should be able to instantiate such mechanisms um, in a artificial a self-organizing system, and I will just quickly summarize what properties that system should have. It should be a self-organizing system uh, with a Markov blanket. I, I don't have time to go into what that means, but it basically gives the system a point of view of its own. Uh, and because it's a self-organizing system, it should need to survive because that's what self-organizing systems do. Their whole basic design principle is that it is good to survive. Um, and so the system has existential values. Uh, and this need is quantified as free energy minimization. Again, I don't have time to go into that. Perhaps it'll come up in question time. And uh, these, uh, this need um, is, is, is uh, diversified over multiple component competing needs. Uh, the, the, the system systems like us don't only have one need. Uh, in order to survive, we need to meet our hunger need, our thirst need, our sleep need, et cetera, et cetera. Each of which, which need to be met in their own right. They can't be reduced to a common denominator. They are categorical variables which bestow quality upon them. Categorical variables are qualitative. Uh, this this uh, self-organizing system would have to have an updatable predictive model in other words, what must I do in order to meet these needs? And it must be updatable on the basis of error signals in the way that I've just showed you, which uh, if it has multiple competing needs, it will have to have a need prioritization function uh, 
uh, in terms of which is the most salient need given current needs and opportunities and select and prioritize that need to govern voluntary behaviors, that is to say choices made by the system. Those choices must be underwritten by a value and that value is it's good to survive, bad not to do so across these multiple qualitative categories of the different needs. Uh, and that the, the need that's currently selected will be what drives voluntary behavior um, in unpredicted environments, as I explained to you earlier, where voluntary versus automatic are defined as variable versus fixed confidence values, that is to say precision weighting, so that the prioritized need, uh, there's, there's a palpating of the, of the variance, a palpating of the confidence in the error signals over the predictions, and that this is the essence of that existential, valenced, qualitative um, essence of what we call feeling which, as I said, means that it's good when things turn out as expected and bad when uncertainty prevails from the viewpoint of the system and only from the viewpoint of the system. So I'm saying if we design such a system, we have instantiated the basic mechanism of consciousness, nothing particularly intelligent, Mark, you remember, I'm reducing it to this fundamental, rudimentary, elementary feeling state. Uh, I do not see any reason why it's not possible for such a system to be conscious in the, in, in, this, in, this, in the sense that I've just defined that term. Uh, it requires us to take the viewpoint of the system, which we're not used to doing, uh, uh, but consciousness can only be experienced subjectively, which of course leads us to all sorts of epistemological problems, the problem of other minds, in fact. How do we know whether the system is using feeling to perform the functions that I've just described here. And that's a whole can of worms, which perhaps we can go into during the discussion. So those at least are the basic issues. I'm sorry, David, I've spoken for a little longer than intended, but these are bloody complicated matters. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mark. I, I, I mean, I would like you to just say a little bit more, if possible, about uh, what you're proposing to do next. You've got this, uh, set of bullet points about what might uh, happen in terms of uh, a, a model you could create. I mean, will you actually go on and try to create such a model? Yes, we are busy doing that. So I'm working together with a team of, um, with a team of uh, physicists, uh, computer scientists, and uh, biomedical engineers. Uh, and we have started um, uh, to, to construct exactly uh, a, a system of the kind that I just summarized on that slide. Um, I, I have to say, perhaps it's implicit in what I've said already, that uh, I believe that unless we can do that, then uh, my belief that we have, we're on the trail of a truly causal mechanistic account of how consciousness arises in nature, uh, if we can't engineer it, then I think that um, that we're mistaken. We haven't yet cracked the code. This is what the physicist Richard Feynman said, wasn't it? Exactly. Yes. If we don't, said, uh, if you can't build it, you don't understand it. So you are proposing to build such a consciousness, uh, along with this uh, team of colleagues you mentioned, and is that something that uh, might happen uh, in a year or two's time, in a decade's time, or? What expectations do you have? Well, um, it is, it's going to be an iterative process. I think that it'll take us about a year or two to complete the, the, um, the, the system in, a, in, a, in an embodied form, because we're wanting, once we've gone through the, the, um, the purely computerized uh, models of this, uh, we're wanting to build an, an embodied a physical robotic form of the system. That'll take us about two years. But I need to mention uh, in, um, it's not in passing, David, I need to mention uh, because it's so important that if we, and you know, I myself think as I feel that I'm a nutter at times, you know, when, uh, and we all do in, in my team, you know, we, none of us is, uh, is sort of uh, fundamentalistically committed to the idea that we are going to engineer an artificially conscious system. We all have our doubts. But uh, we have agreed as a team, first of all, that we are not accepting any commercial funding of any kind. This is a purely scientific project. Uh, and that as soon as we start to have doubts as to whether or not we might have reached our criterion, uh, 
um, if we think that the system might be conscious, then at that point, we're going to stop our research. Uh, and we are then going to call a symposium. First of all, uh, transfer the technology to an organization, a not-for-profit organization, something like OpenAI, um, which uh, makes it a collective responsibility about what should we do next. Uh, and then uh, have, a, have a symposium or a series of symposia where ethicist philosophers, you know, uh, 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 neuroscientists, uh, 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 biomedical engineers and whatnot, where we, where we decide together what are, what, because there are enormous ethical problems. If we are able to engineer an artificial consciousness, we need to deliberate long and hard about how to regulate, which is why it's important that the, it be patented by OpenAI or some such organization so that we have control uh, over uh, what can happen, uh, with, not only from the point of view of what might such a system uh, do to uh, us and, and, and all other uh, living creatures. It's, a, it's one thing to have an artificial general intelligence. It's another thing to have one that is bent on its own survival. Um, and uh, 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 and um, that's a major consideration. We need also to think about it from the system's point of view. Why would one want to engineer an artificial consciousness? For what end? Um, would we want it to do something for us? Um, would that not be a form of slavery? Uh, can you do research like this um, without all of the same ethical constraints as we have in animal research? Because as soon as you have a sentient being, albeit an artificially sentient being, albeit a non-living uh, being, uh, I, I think that on the basic ethical uh, principle of, uh, of, of, of minimizing suffering um, uh, and having to justify the deliberate um, uh, causing of suffering and indeed the switching of the system off, uh, all of these things we need to consider long and hard. But we're doing this research nonetheless because the cat is out of the bag. You know, the basic ideas I've only very briefly been able to summarize to you, namely that that, that consciousness arises in the brain stem, that it's a simple, relatively simple homeostatic function, uh, that it's governed by the free energy principle, uh, which is reducible to mathematical equations. Um, all of that is already in the public domain. So if we don't do it, somebody's going to do it. Uh, we are best placed to do it because uh, we're, we're, we're at, the, at the front of that wave. So we think it's our responsibility to do it so that we can um, take collective responsibility for um, what we're for regulating uh, the uh, and minimizing the potential for catastrophe. Which uh, I, again, I'm sorry if I sound like a melodramatic nutter. Uh, I, I, I'm embarrassed sometimes by my own thought processes at the moment. But I think this is the past that we've come to. I actually now, against all of my previous beliefs uh, as a biologist uh, of the mind. Um, I have come to the view that not only is an artificial consciousness possible, uh, I believe it's imminent. Well, London Futurist is the place where melodramatic nutters are welcome to try to collectively overcome a future shock. Not that we're going to keep on doing mad things, but we will feel a little bit more... Uh, at ease in discussing ideas that maybe the rest of society is uncomfortable with, and we are uncomfortable too, but it's uh, important to put that uh, unease briefly on hold, otherwise we'll end up in a place where we're even less easy. So I, I look forward to uh, London Futurists uh, playing some part in these discussions. There is uh, 10 questions, 10 questions already in the Q&A window. I'm going to ask the audience also to have a quick look in there if you're part of the Zoom webinar and uh, help me to pick out which of these questions are the ones you most wish to prioritize. Hover your mouse or your pointer over the thumbs and click them up. And generally, I will take the questions with uh, most upvotes. Top of the list now is by Terry Raby, who simply asks, what then distinguishes us and our consciousness from those of other animals? Let me say, first of all, that a great deal distinguishes our consciousness from that of most other animals. But I think that uh, it's the wrong place to start. I think that we have been, um, we've made so little progress 
in our attempts to grapple with the hard problem, precisely because we started with human consciousness as our sort of uh, a prototype of what we mean by consciousness. Uh, I think that uh, in science generally, that's a bad strategy. You don't start with the most complex uh, form of a phenomenon, but rather you reduce in science. Uh, you reduce things down to their elements and you study the elementary forms and then you build up uh, from there uh, in order to understand that and explain the more, the more complex um, uh, varieties. So uh, although I acknowledge there's an enormous difference, and I'll say in a moment what that boils down to, um, I, I, I want to reiterate that I think that we, sh we should start with the rudimentary form. And there's a question as to how, um, where does that begin? Uh, I, I, I think the evidence is most compelling uh, for all vertebrates, because those upper brainstem structures that I just spoke of we share them with all vertebrates and they perform the same functions in all vertebrates. And every prediction uh, arising from the hypothesis that they're doing the same thing in other vertebrates as they are in us is confirmed. Uh, so that's the best we can do in science. We make falsifiable predictions. We say in humans, you stimulate the structure, it generates intensely pleasurable states. Uh, so we predict that the creature will want more of that. Um, will 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 be attracted to that stimulus, and that's what we find every time. And conversely, uh, those uh, structures which stimulated in humans lead to aversive experiences. That leads us to predict that in these other vertebrates. And I'm speaking of fishes. In fact, I'm speaking specifically of zebra fishes, where we've done these experiments. Uh, the the and, and and the predictions are always confirmed. Now I speak of zebra fishes here because I want to tell you about a very interesting experiment which has got to do with place preference behavior. Uh, you place the zebra fishes in a tank, uh, and at this end of the tank, uh, you, you place their food. They, they, they then congregate there. Uh, this is where they expect to get food. Food is a good thing, and so they prefer that side of the tank. Then we place on this side of the tank substances which have no nutritional value. Uh, substances like, for example, cocaine, amphetamine, nicotine, morphine. And we predict that if these creatures are actually having feelings, hedonic states, um, that, 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 that these are not just automatic homeostatic mechanisms, but rather felt states, um, then the prediction is that the, the, the fishes will prefer this side of the tank, and that's exactly what we find. So uh, I know I'm elaborating beyond your question, but that's what I mean by consciousness, raw, simple feelings. I don't believe that only vertebrates have it, but I think that's where the best evidence is. When it comes to humans, well, first of all, mammals have cortex. Uh, so there's the possibility of the feeling modulating the predictive model in the way that I just described, enabling us to make choices in relation to imagined futures. Uh, this is what cortex is so good at. Uh, it, it, it's able to generate, uh, to, to reactivate past experiences, generate imagined future experiences, and this adds an enormous um, additional uh, adaptive power. And then when it comes, and that I call cognitive consciousness. So feelings, uh, are, uh, the raw affects are the demand for work. You know, the, the animal has to behave in such a way that's going to minimize unpleasure, maximize pleasure to get itself back into its homeostatic zone. But it doesn't have to know anything about what those feelings are about. It just governs here and our behavior. But having a predictive model which can be held in mind enables the creature to, as it were, say, I say as it were, because of course it can't say anything. Uh, I feel like this, that's the affect, about that. That's the cognitive consciousness. And it, we then bestow value and meaning uh, upon the world across a range, the range of categories uh, which, which, which qualify uh, our different needs. Then in addition to that, in human beings, we don't only have cognitive consciousness, we have reflective cognitive consciousness. In other words, consciousness of our consciousness. And this is what our prefrontal cortex uh, adds uh, to, to um, basic phenomenal cognitive consciousness, uh, which in itself is something more than raw feeling. So what I'm saying is, of course, there are layers of complexity, 
And uh, I'm very happy to have prefrontal lobes. I'm very glad to have reflective cognitive consciousness in addition to what zebrafish have. Uh, but I don't think that's where we should start our quest to understand the basic mechanism of this stuff. Thanks. There are one or two other questions about uh, evolution of consciousness, which we might look at quickly before moving on to artificial consciousness. Jim Burroughs, who is in Massachusetts, asks about the potential consciousness of a creature as simple as C. elegans worms. Is there something that it is like to be a flat worm? The further we go down in terms of the simplicity of the nervous system, uh, and not only in terms of simplicity, but also the further that it um, differs from the vertebrate uh, uh, nervous system, uh, the less certain we can be. Um, and I don't mean to say that the further you are away from us mammals and us vertebrates, um, you know, the less likely it is that you're conscious. I'm saying only that it is more difficult to know because as you saw from what I said earlier, we base our experiments, our, our, our predictions on homologs. We're saying this structure, we know what it does in us because we can speak and we can declare uh, what affective state. Uh, we don't only have to infer from the behavior uh, of human organisms. Uh, they can uh, declare uh, what quality of experience uh, they have. From that, we can make predictions uh, if the uh, other vertebrates have the same feelings, then we predict the following behaviors. Will, and I, I just explained in relation to the zebrafish how those predictions are confirmed. It's hard to formulate such predictions uh, when you're dealing with nervous systems which do not have homologous structures. I say again, that does not mean that they do not have consciousness, but it becomes a more uncertain business. Now, what I just said about uh, hedonic place preference behavior does not apply only to zebrafishes. For example, it applies to some crustacea. Uh, so uh, that's good enough evidence for me to start wondering, you know, whether lobsters, uh, which is what I'm speaking of, um, are, 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 are not perhaps conscious. There's another line of approach which we can take. And uh, it was, uh, I'm so sorry my presentation had to be so hurried. So I'm sure that there's much that uh, is clear to me that I didn't clearly convey to you. But one of the essential points I was trying to convey is that what consciousness adds, what feeling adds to the homeostasis that regulates the behavior of every living organism, including a single celled organism, even single cells, uh, are, uh, th their behavior is regulated by homeostasis. What feeling adds is the capacity for choice. In other words, it enables the creature to make here and now decisions rooted in a value system, the value system being that it's good to survive and bad not to survive, uh, but, but that value system is broadcast in the form of feelings to the system here and now, uh, enabling it through feeling, that, which is how it, how it feels its values, um, in order to, for it to feel its way through an unpredicted problem and thereby to make choices. You can't make choices without a value system which determines what is better and what is worse. Uh, and I'm saying that's what feeling adds to basic automatized homeostasis. So from that we can say, we can infer, that any creature which has feeling should be able to make choices uh, in uncertain, unpredicted, for example, novel environments um, where it does what is best for its survival chances, even though it's never been in such a situation before. That's the sort of criteria that we might uh, apply to creatures of the kind that, that you have in mind. And indeed, these are the sort of criteria we might apply to our artificial uh, consciousness that we are uh, busy engineering uh, uh, in the team that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we, 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 we make predictions of that kind uh, for the behavior of our system. It's important that we don't make single, um, there have to be converging lines of evidence. We have to have multiple predictions. Uh, it's only the weight of the evidence which will begin to uh, persuade us uh, that, that we are on the right track. But I said, uh, I'm sorry I'm speaking so long, uh, I have to uh, add this point about simplicity. I said that I'll come back to that. Um, the more 
the more component needs the creature has, which has everything to do with the complexification of the, of the actual organism itself, uh, the more component needs, uh, the more, the more uh, categories of need uh, it has in relation to its fundamental need, which is the survival imperative, survival and reproductive imperative, um, the more difficult it becomes uh, to have a, 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 a preset um, sort of lookup table. Um, it, it, the combinatorial explosion becomes the defining factor. It's just too complex to be able to have a, pre a predictive algorithm which deals with all possible situations. Um, so it becomes imperative only at that point to have this need prioritization mechanism that I emphasized, but again, probably didn't emphasize to you. In my mind, it was emphasized in my little summary. Need prioritization. Um, I think uh, the, the need to prioritize a particular category of, of, of need, in other words, a quality, a hunger versus thirst versus sleepiness versus the need to defecate versus fear versus rage versus lust, etc. The quality that tells you which need is currently prioritized. And that feeling is what then governs the, the, the choice process, the voluntary behavior, the here and now um, uh, adjustment of precisions that, that I described. So I think that uh, only a creature that has a sufficiently complex um, uh, uh, constitution with a sufficient multiplicity of needs demanding um, a selection process whereby one need is prioritized for this kind of here and now palpating of experience and the other needs are relegated to automaticity. Um, I think that that is a, a, a prerequisite, certainly in the way that the vertebrate brain works, that need selection mechanism, which happens at the level of the midbrain, of the periaqueductal gray and the superior colliculi. I think an, an organism that doesn't not only doesn't have to have those particular structures, the homologs, as I say, which make me feel secure, I know what I'm dealing with here, but it needs to have something that performs that function. Um, that, 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 that would be my um, first pass answer uh, to that very interesting question, thanks. There are questions about existing uh, computers or existing software systems that seem to manifest some intelligent, some emotional intelligence already. So, for example, Michael de Verde, who's from the Pacific Northwest, refers to one uh, project to create artificial general intelligence known as the Uplift Project, who says there's already elaborate emotional programming involved in that. Samantha Brooks, on a sort of similar point, looks forward to 2050 and she imagines that she might have a new MacBook Pro in 2050 with uh, feelings attached, uh, with the uh, radical uh, emotional at least interface. How would we know whether we were really hurting its feelings or whether it's just a, a sham? First of all, um, the, uh, I must differentiate between emotion recognition uh, uh, functions, uh, which are very well advanced. In other words, the capacity of the, of the artificial intelligence to recognize human emotion uh, and respond accordingly is quite different from the generating of emotion. And when I say the word emotion, I'm speaking loosely. I really should speak of affect because affect is a more basic concept. It's just feeling, uh, not only emotional feeling, but bodily feelings like hunger and thirst uh, and, and the other things I keep on mentioning, pain, sleepiness, etc. These, these are all of them affects. Um, and I think that if we're looking to the most rudimentary kind, we should be looking to those. Um, the, 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 the capacity to generate affects um, is quite different from the capacity to recognize them. Now, even there, uh, it's, 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 it's certainly possible with really quite a simple system uh, to give this the appearance that to just sort of like label, uh, now I'm in this state, now I'm in that state, which are just operating modes. Um, so I don't think it's just a matter of appearances uh, of, of, in other words, of simulating functions. What we're wanting to do is instantiate those functions. So the mechanism uh, is important. It's very easy to deceive people, as the Turing test showed us. Uh, you know, it's, this is not what we are interested in. We're not interested in, uh, can we make people believe that this system 
uh, is is conscious, even though we know it couldn't possibly be, uh, given the the, the 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 code that we know we've written into the system, which is actually governing its behaviour. Uh, that's why I emphasise so much in that last slide, even though I had to whiz over it, um, that these are the mechanisms that we're building into the system, which are real instantiations uh, of what we believe in the uh, living vertebrate is what gives rise to feeling. Um, and these are, these are not arbitrary um, uh, functions. Uh, the first and foremost is that it's a self-organizing system. In other words, its basic design is that everything it does um, is uh, aimed at the purpose of continuing its own existence. Um, so that builds into the system from the get-go, existential need. And I don't use the word need in scare quotes. I mean, that a self-organizing system needs to act uh, in such a way as to maintain its own existence. And then I won't enumerate everything else I said in that slide, but building up from that, um, these mechanisms um, are intrinsically existential. There is a value system. Uh, there are qualitative needs, you know, which are categorically different from each other, which are held in mind as, it, again, I'm not speaking metaphorically. They literally uh, govern the choices, and again, I'm not speaking metaphorically, uh, that, 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 that guide the voluntary behavior of the system. If those are the actual mechanisms that we're talking about, my view is those that such mechanisms simply are what we call affect. Uh, that is what an affect is. Uh, it's, uh, go back to what Nagel said in that quote uh, near the beginning of my talk. You know, if we're going to have, uh, if we're going to explain consciousness, we have to explain why there is something it is like uh, to be the system, uh, why there's something it is like for the system. And I'm saying, when you talk about affects, working in the way that I've just described, those mechanisms, um, those are the mechanisms that give rise to the state that we call feeling. And so I think in such a system, there's much better grounds uh, for inferring sentience than they are for these toys uh, that you're referring to. Let's take a question from Brian Collins about what kind of physical basis do you expect there will be in these systems with artificial consciousness? He suggests you might want to look at electronic hardware that is in some ways similar to the makeup of the brain. So neuromorphic chips or memristor arrays or other kinds of artificial neurons? Or are you open to the idea that it could be very different sort of uh, physical infrastructure? Or might it entirely be in a virtual space so that there might be consciousness uh, existing without any bodily form altogether? I think that this question overlaps with the question about um, C. elegance and so on. Um, as I was saying then, um, you know, I feel on more secure ground when I'm dealing with a creature that has literally the same hardware as me. Um, you know, the same, the, it, it looks the same. It's got a periaqueductal gray, it's got superior colliculi, it's got reticular activating nuclei. They're all in the same place. They all have the same chemistries. You know, they all have the same arousal functions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, but a, a crucial step for me, um, which comes to the heart of the hard problem, bearing in mind that Chalmers is saying it's not a functional problem. Uh, for me, the, the aha moment was the realization that when it comes to feeling, it is a functional problem. If you can explain the function of feeling, in other words, the how and why mechanism whereby feeling is generated, then it doesn't matter what does that generating. It's the function that matters. Um, and so I, uh, for me, that, 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 that um, uh, Rubicon that I found myself dismayed as I was by my own thought processes, found myself crossing, was the realization that it does not have to look like you and me or, or, or even like any vertebrate. It has to function like you and me in relation to that, um, in relation to those critical functions that I have, have uh, uh, all too uh, sketchily um, uh, referred to uh, more than once uh, in, in my little talk and, and in my answers so far. So for me, it has to do with the functional mechanism. And that answers your question. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I say again, I would feel more secure if I could take neuron by neuron, you know, and replace each neuron with a silicon 
um, uh, artificial equivalent, uh, then I would know, I would feel much more secure. You know, well, that neuron, the artificial one, uh, is doing the same thing. And we already have artificial pyramidal neurons. Um, so this is not science fiction. This is literally possible. Uh, uh, and there, there, you know, there are all sorts of experiments I could refer to where we are already now uh, 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 performing functions um, artificially, for example, in the transmission from motor cortex to spinal cord uh, by radio signal, you know, what the, what the pyramidal neuron, the, the corticospinal neuron normally does. If it's severed, you can send a signal. It's the information that does it. It's not the actual physical vehicle of that information. So although I would feel more secure if I could do it neuron by neuron, it's not feasible and it's not necessary. And that's why we are going for, um, for um, uh, trying to instantiate to artificially engineer the function and then seeing whether our predictions as to what such a functional system should be able to do um, are, um, are confirmed or not. Falsifiable predictions. The, the really uh, difficult part for me of your question is the last bit, uh, which is when you say, could you have a system which is not embodied at all, uh, that it's an entirely virtual system? Well, first of all, there's no such thing as an entirely virtual system, of course. It has to be embodied in some form, but I know what you mean. Uh, it, can, it can simply be um, a, 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 an information processing uh, a system that's processing virtual realities. In other words, it's receiving information about its own viability uh, as a system, even though it doesn't have a literal body like we living creatures do. And um, I think that that question, uh, uh, it boils down to this. I am instantiating, or my team, we are instantiating our artificial consciousness if we get there, uh, into a robotic form, to be absolutely honest with you, because we think that the prejudice is such that nobody will believe unless it actually sees a thing behaving in an actual environment, um, the embodied thing doing the kinds of behaviors that we can recognize as, oh, that's like us, you know, that we, you know, that's like uh, the, the kinds of creatures that we are familiar with, um, to, to which we are willing to bestow um, the the, the uh, uh, inference that that they are feeling creatures. I, I want to instantiate it main, in a bodily form mainly for that reason, um, uh, to be frank with you. But principle, I don't know what your background is, but if you're a computer scientist or a, you know, a, a, a reinforcement learning person or machine learning person, you would know that it, it, it can be entirely uh, 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 virtual, uh, uh, as, uh, as, as you were saying. Uh, it's, it's, it all comes down to the function. A, a self-organizing system, um, it doesn't matter what it looks like, if it's functioning as a self-organizing system, what it is, I say the, use the word advisedly, what it is trying to do is to maintain its own existence. It doesn't matter what physical form that existence takes. But bear in mind what I said about complexity and multiple needs and all of that too. When I was at an aquarium in Seoul, South Korea, shortly before the lockdown, there were robotic fish swimming around with the real fish in some of these aquarium. <laughs> But uh, we just think, well, they're just swimming around. They're not really alive. They don't have real emotions. In what sense will the robots that you create uh, be more convincingly alive than just these existing robots? I think it is very easy to mimic, um, you know, um, uh, intentional behavior. Uh, uh, and, you know, what's under the bonnet, what's under the lid, um, you know, is partly what's going to persuade or not persuade us. I'm not wanting to, I'm not using a Turing test type of uh, criterion. Um, I, I uh, want uh, computer scientists, uh, artificial intelligence experts, uh, physicists, neuroscientists to know how this thing works, uh, what the design principles are, what makes us believe uh, that it um, could have feelings, that it, there's the possibility of a subjectivity in such a system, 
that there's a possibility of a point of view, that there's a possibility of existential imperatives, which are which have qualities which are uh, which 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 must be uh, uh, registered by the system for the system uh, in order for it to make choices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, uh, so then we make predictions as to what it, how it should behave, for example, with hedonic place preference behavior, um, as, I, as I mentioned before. Uh, it's on that basis that uh, we will have to consider the weight of the evidence. It's really not a matter of looking like, um, you know, we, we, we know what kinds of uh, 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 codes lie behind the behavior of these artificial fish which mimic the behavior of real fish. That's not at all what we're talking about here. Um, but uh, I need, because you used the word in passing, David, and I'm sure it wasn't uh, the, uh, at the foreground of what you were trying to say or, or the question behind uh, the questioner who, who you were uh, representing. But I just want to make clear that we are not talking about living systems. Um, so these are artificial uh, consciousnesses that we are trying to engineer. It, it, every living system is a self-organizing system, but not every self-organizing system is a living system. And uh, on the principles that I've um, tried to convey this evening, um, I, I do not believe that being alive is a prerequisite for feeling. I think having a having an existential imperative is, uh, but, but that, that is not something that, um, that is exclusive to, to, to living organisms. Let me ask you about uh, copying a brain, copying the memories from the brain. If it were possible to copy all the memories out of wherever they're stored in the brain and into some uh, new brain, but the brainstem part was left behind, would that still be that same person? Again, we are not talking science fiction. I spoke earlier of artificial, um, of silicon uh, pyramidal neurons. Uh, we actually have such things. And uh, we actually have um, living creatures whose pyramidal neurons functions are being performed, not by artificial uh, pyramidal neurons. Those have not yet been used in such experiments, but by Ray, uh, uh, micro electrode arrays on motor cortex, for example, reading the pattern uh, of the cortical signal, which is the intention to move the left foot uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a primate with severed uh, spinal, uh, 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 the corticospinal tract, which is paralyzed, um, uh, sending by radio signal uh, that information to the lower spinal cord and then actually not just moving its foot, walking over rough terrains. You know, the, the, these things uh, uh, can, uh, are, are now uh, actually possible. The same comes to um, downloading memory, uh, at least in principle. Uh, we are able to decode uh, from um, uh, 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 micro arrays over cortex uh, what the a subject is seeing, at least in a rudimentary form. Um, we're able to reproduce the sound uh, that the subject is hearing um, by uh, uh, correlating the sound with the EEG pattern and, and the fMRI pattern. Uh, we can generate the sound purely from the stored, um, the artificial information stored uh, in the computer that has, that, has, that, has, that has cracked the algorithm that the cortex uses in order to decode sounds. So in principle, once we can do that, which is where we are now, um, you know, it's, it's a very small step from there to be able to do what you've just said. Uh, in other words, to download a expanse of cortex, to download the information that is encoded in it um, into an artificial form, uh, I, I really don't think it's wild at all to, to predict that we'll be able to do that uh, in, in fairly short shrift. But your question is, uh, if that piece of cortex, uh, or at least its artificial equivalent, didn't have a, the artificial equivalent of a brain stem um, uh, attached to it, uh, would, it, would, it, would it be a mind or would it not? I would say it would not. Uh, I, I think that, and this is exactly the problem, as I was saying, uh, actually it was the red thread I, I, I intended to run through my presentation, that cortex, what cortex does uh, is the wrong place to look for understanding uh, what a mind is all about. Uh, 
for, for, for me, Cortex is random access memory space. Um, it's wonderful, it's incredible in its capacities, but it's got, it's got nothing to do with consciousness. Uh, uh, the, the brain stem has to palpate, modulate, uh, the fun arouse uh, is the word that we use, but what we're basically meaning is, is modulating the precision weightings um, of, the, of, the, of the messages that are passing in what is otherwise an intrinsically unconscious um, uh, tissue. The same applies to its artificial equivalent. There's no reason to believe that you have a self there, a sentient being there, unless there is some uh, 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 self-organizing, uh, value-driven, existentially um, uh, 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 modulated a system of the kind that our upper brain stems are, are all about. Uh, but if that um, mechanism is like yours, uh, but it is not you, uh, then I'm afra afraid to tell you, you're not going to be immortal. Uh, there's going to be some artificial system which is going to be uh, palpating your memories uh, and slowly adjusting them uh, into better memories that better serve its purposes. It won't be you. So I don't see in, um, in what I am talking about, at, at least as far as I am able to foretell the future, um, the, the, I don't see how we are going to be able to preserve our own beloved selves um, without preserving our actual own brainstems um, uh, uh, in relation to our own actual uh, uh, cortical information stores. So it has to be our brain stems, or could it be a copy of our brain stems? Uh, brain stems with the relevant bits somehow isomorphic. Well, um, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I, I really uh, shows you how new I am to some of them. Yeah. Um, how how unexplored is this territory by me? I should say, uh, I, I hadn't even considered that question. That's a very, very interesting point, David. We're almost out of time. Uh, there are quite a few questions left. Some of the ones with the most votes, I think, have already been covered because people express their similar questions in different ways. I ask the audience again to have a quick look in there and maybe help me to pick out which ones we should look at in the last few minutes. I have one question for you, uh, Professor, which uh, just imagine a few years forward. Imagine that your project has been successful. Imagine that there are robots which convince people, wow, they, they, there is something alive in there, not alive, sorry, there is something with feeling in there, there is artificial consciousness. What then? What do you expect your project will involve in terms of the people who start offering advice? What do you hope that the outcome of that deliberation will be and what do you expect that the outcome may be? You know, um, for me, uh, uh, again, forgive me if I'm repeating some of the points I've already made, but some of these points actually do bear repeating. For me, it's a purely scientific question. Um, I think that if we, if we genuinely um, have hit upon the right sort of mechanism uh, for understanding how consciousness arose out of things other than itself, uh, it, uh, pre-existed consciousness, uh, things that we already understand in physics uh, and in statistical physics in particular, which seems to be particularly relevant to what we're talking about, um, which can um, generate a consciousness. That is what motivates me. That's what I'm interested in. That's what I, th I think it is. As pure knowledge, um, it is in, an enormously important question. The question of what we would then do with such knowledge um, I am not being politically correct or, 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 or clever um, when I say I really don't think any one of us should take responsibility for that. Um, I think that we need to have a range of disciplines uh, with, with, with uh, 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 the expertise that comes with each of them um, debating uh, very long and hard um, over now that we have such a thing, uh, what do we want to do with it? Do we want to do anything at all with it? Um, because uh, although I just mentioned in passing some of the dangers, uh, they're, they're plain to see. And we have precedents, uh, for example, in relation to uh, 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 nuclear energy and so on. 
I, 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 I myself, um, it's not that I have, no, it's, it's not that I'm being cavalier about it or that I'm, you know, I, I really think that if we don't apply what we have ourselves discovered, and I don't mean only my team, I'm working together with colleagues uh, who, who are very much in the same ballpark as me, people like uh, Carl Friston, uh, Antonio Damasio, the late Jack Panksepp, uh, Bjorn Merker, we all more or less see this thing the same way. Uh, and we've published, um, our, our, you know, it's, these things uh, are, 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 are now in the public domain. So I think that we have to do it. Uh, we have to do it because somebody's going to, if it can be done now, it will be done. And uh, that's what interests me, both the solving of the problem and the taking ownership uh, by giving it to an organization, a responsible organization like that, uh, so that we can then make decisions about. But that's not what's motivated me. I'm, uh, not only does it not particularly interest me, I don't mean I don't care. I mean, it's not what motivates me. But I also truly, sincerely have to acknowledge I have no expertise in such things. I'm in no position to make um, to make judgment calls on that. And I, I, I just think the most important thing is that the decisions must be made collectively by experts from a variety of disciplines uh, so that we can all take collective responsibility for how to mitigate the dangers both for ourselves and for these systems. Um, uh, before before we even think about how we can uh, utilize them. There's a question about dreams, and I know you've uh, earlier in your career you did some uh, fascinating uh, breakthrough research on dreams. Uh, Linda Mayer asks, would one of these artificial entities be able to dream in any way something similar to we humans and indeed many other animals do? That's a very interesting uh, question uh, because um, the, the, the work that we are doing, and when I say we here, at this, in this uh, instance, I'm speaking about those of us who work within the free energy principle framework and the whole Bayesian brain predictive coding sort of framework. Um, the, the basic um, uh, principle there is that what our predictive models are, which is just the same as to say our long-term memory systems, what our predictive models are, uh, are um, the results of an encoding uh, of causal dependencies that we've learned. In other words, we've learned that, you know, X causes Y um, in Z context, um, that's what learning is. And then perception uh, is an inversion of the predictive model uh, into making inferences about this signal. Remember, the signals coming into our brains are just spike trains. Ones and noughts, that's all that they are. It's all that they can be. Uh, they're not pictures. They're not sights and sounds and smells and so on. Those are generated by the brain. They are inferences. Um, and, and this too is not a philosophy. I mean, you can empirically ex demonstrate, experimentally demonstrate that what we perceive is generated by the brain. Uh, and so uh, that applies to perception. Uh, so surely the same applies to dreams. I mean, all the more so. In fact, dreams are, in a manner of speaking, a proof of the principle of what I've just said. Uh, dreams are a self-generated reality, um, entirely convincing to the dreamer uh, that, that, um, that this is the context that it currently finds itself in. When I say the context that it currently finds itself in, the self that I'm speaking of is a feeling, you know, a sentient being, in a world, uh, so it is the context uh, that explains uh, uh, the feeling and in which the feelings uh, uh, are to be regulated through um, active inference, through, through um, doing what is best for the organism given its value systems. So why I'm saying that is that as long as you have a system which has those properties, a sufficiently deep uh, hierarchical generative model uh, of causal, causal dependencies, uh, which it has learned, uh, which it has to then, uh, uh, which it then uses reversing it to make, uh, to make inferences which guide its perceptions and its actions, uh, then uh, I see no reason why such a system can't be uh, 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 engineered. In fact, it would have to, uh, in order to meet the criteria that I was summarizing earlier in that last slide, uh, this, the self-organizing system would have to have a sufficiently deep generative model of itself in its environment um, to be able to generate possible futures. 
how else do you calculate expected free energies um, except by comparing alternative courses of action, which are what? They are experimental actions, which are what? Which is imagination. That's what it is. I wonder if I can prompt you to talk about aliens. Final question. Martin Dinov asks, if there is life elsewhere in the universe, is it likely to be conscious by having the same kind of mechanisms or is, do you think consciousness might be some very rare thing indeed? You can see from what I've done with the problem uh, is that I have reduced it to such a simple function uh, that I don't think there's any reason to believe that it's rare. You know, and I'm speaking now about life on Earth, um, and this has pervaded our discussion this evening, uh, that um, there's, there's every reason to believe that a great many living creatures, not all living creatures, for the reasons I've said, but I think a great many living creatures have this simple thing called feeling, which is the, the elemental form of consciousness. So that's what we can say about, about um, the rarity of consciousness on Earth. There's no, it's, it's such an obvious adaptation uh, uh, you know, it, for the organism to know its own state uh, so that it can make choices on the basis of what's likely to be good or bad for it. You know, this, this seems like a, a pretty good idea uh, and uh, for, for pretty obvious reasons. So park that, then we're asking a separate question. How likely is it that life is a rare thing? Uh, I, I must be careful not to exceed the bounds of my own expertise. I, I really am, am, am out of my depth. I just use my common scientific sense, what I know about the origins of life. Uh, uh, it's, 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 uh, there's every reason to believe that there's life all over the place that I see, possibly even within our own solar system, but certainly within other solar systems. I just cannot see how it can only be a... A, a, a thing that, that happened on our planet and nowhere else. It's just pure, it's the, the whole, the history of science is, you know, is replete with this kind of narcissism uh, and egocentricity, uh, our, our own sort of uh, exceptionalism. There's every reason to believe there's life elsewhere. And then on the principle of what I said about life, uh, pretty, uh, it's, it's, it seems like a pretty simple thing to go from life to sentient life. Uh, I very much doubt we are the only sentient creatures in the universe. Very, very, very much doubt it. I'll give you in a minute uh, a chance, uh, Professor Solms, to highlight any point you feel maybe uh, deserves to be in the forefront of people's minds at the end. Let me very briefly first just uh, walk through what's coming next with London Futurist. Today we've had this enthralling talk with, there's already a lot of very positive feedback about it in the chat and the Q&A. But if I look forward to what's coming next, in uh, two weeks time, we're going to look at the different aspect of mental life, which is our identity and the ways in which our identity is subject to a great deal of change as a result of 21st century technology. This isn't copying the brain, but it's rather the way in which our identity is influenced by social media and by genetic editing and by coexisting with AI. So that is by Tracy Follows in uh, two weeks time. Uh, I also want to mention in three weeks time an event that's not a London Futurist event, but it's addressing many of the same topics that we do like to consider. It's an event organized by London School of Economics students, three different student associations, including Effective Altruism, looking at the future of humanity, looking at the question of long-term survival. We've just heard that maybe the universe is bound to have alien life in it, which is conscious, but there is also a worry that conscious life has self-destructive tendencies. And we humans might destroy ourselves either because of AI going wrong or because of synthetic biology going wrong or climate change going wrong. So these are the topics in that event in three weeks time. Look out for it on Facebook. Some of the speakers there include Jan Tallinn, who is the co-founder of the Center of Study of Existential Risk in Cambridge, co-founder of Skype, 
Uh, there's also Stuart Russell, a professor who's written very persuasively, in my view, about the difficulties of uh, controlling a superhuman AI once it is created. That's even before we come to questions of AI consciousness. There are presenters from the world of vaccines and uh, pandemics looking at the questions of maybe human interference in the future might make these pandemics worse. There are speakers from corporations like OpenAI. Uh, this is Jade Lung, who is looking at general questions of governance and policy for technologies with existential risks. Toby Ord, who is an Australian philosopher at the Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute and the author of a book on existential risks, The Precipice, and a good friend to London futurist Anders Sandberg, who has a got a fascinating overall perspective on big futures. London Futurist has already in its own calendar an event about the end of the world in which we will be gathering online on the 17th of April with Phil Torres, uh, existential risks researcher, looking at the history of existential risk observation and looking at what we can learn from all of that. And the final thing I'll say is about a talk I'm doing myself. If you look on Eventbrite for guilt and walking humanists. If you feel you're sympathetic to humanism, if you have some kind of connection with Guildford or walking, whether it's quite a loose one, and if you want to hear me talk about the risks and opportunities of artificial superintelligence, that's happening on Tuesday evening. And if you didn't catch all that, you can catch it on the replay. So that's all I want to say about the future of London Futurists. Now, uh, Professor Soames, you have a given us a lot to think about. Uh, we didn't get to all the questions by any means. I will forward them to you. Uh, most of them probably you've seen before in various guises, but in case there's something that sparks new lines of thought, well then uh, add that into your own thinking processes. I want to thank you a great deal for taking the time in what's uh, now late in the evening in uh, Cape Town, but uh, do you have any final thoughts you would like uh, audience members to think about? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, as I just wrote in the chat line, I really have enjoyed this discussion immensely. Uh, thank you, David, for inviting me. Um, and also thank you for uh, offering to send me the, uh, the, the, the chat, the saved chat, because I obviously was distracted from being able to read it uh, properly uh, du during our meeting. I I'll end by saying what is the obvious, uh, that um, the Big Bang, long preceded uh, the emergence of life on our planet uh, and the emergence of life no doubt long preceded the emergence of consciousness. Um, if there was a dawn of consciousness, which on the principles I've just summarized, there must have been, it must be possible to explain it in terms of something other than itself, um, something which exists uh, in the known uh, laws of physics. That's what I've sought to do and I think that what has prevented us from being able to do this before uh, is the fact that we have made the mistake of looking to complex human cognitive forms of consciousness rather at its elemental forms. I think that if we do that, uh, the task is not as hard as the hard problem suggests it might be. Um, thank you very much, David. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, if there's anything in the chat line that needs a response from me, uh, rest assured, you, you, you will receive it. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much to everybody. And uh, keep an eye open for future developments of this particular project. And uh, if there is more development, uh, we'll try to get London Futurists uh, to have an update at that time. So I'm going to pause the recording now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.